Hello and welcome to this PIR live event brought to you by Partners in Research Canada. My name is Stacey Joyce and I'll be your host today. Remember that you can ask your questions by using the chat function as part of this window and select everyone in the to field so that all of our students can see the questions coming in. And you can include your name, your school and or your city. Let us know uh, where you're from and we'll give you a shout out when we ask your question. So today's guest is Dr. Chris D uh, DeMarin. Chris DeMarin, and he is a professor and the director of the Institute for Aerospace Studies at the University of Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'll let you take it away. Great. Thank you very much, Stacey. So I'm just going to bring up my slides here. Excellent. All right, I can see that just fine. You're ready to go. Okay, great. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm going to talk to you about uh, some aspects of my research, which is in the area of spacecraft uh, dynamics and control. So basically, in our research group, we study the motion and try and control the motion of satellites and spacecraft. So this morning I want to talk to you about solar sails and solar sailing and what we might actually do with solar sails in the form of interesting applications. So let's start out with the notion of an orbit. So uh, an orbit is the path that a body follows through space. And orbits are produced by gravity and basically two or, or more bodies uh, uh, will, will enter orbits due to the mutual gravitation acting between them. So this was first explained by Sir Isaac Newton uh, a long time ago. And uh, some examples, uh, the Earth goes around the Sun, we all know that, and that takes about a year. And the shape of that orbit is almost a, a, a circle. And uh, another family of orbits are those corresponding to satellites which are moving around the Earth. And I've got a little picture on my slide here showing you a spacecraft going around Mars. And in that picture, you can see it's not quite a circle. Uh, more generally, uh, orbits uh, take the shape of what we call an ellipse, which is a, 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 a circle that uh, gets stretched in, in one direction. So here, for example, are orbits that you're probably most familiar with. These are uh, the planets going around the sun. So we now have eight planets. Uh, I think you may have heard Pluto is no longer considered a planet. But uh, the orbits of the planets around the sun are also almost uh, circles. Some of them are a little more stretched than others. And they all more or less lie in the same plane that we call the ecliptic plane, which is the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. Now today I'm going to mainly be concerned with uh, satellite orbits um, or spacecraft more generally. So these uh, can orbit the Earth in all kinds of different ways. Um, in the picture I'm showing you right here, we have a satellite that's going over the, the poles of the Earth. And uh, many of our satellites that, for example, image the Earth to help us predict weather, for example, are in these kind of what we call a polar orbit. Later on, I'm going to tell you about something called a geostationary orbit, which is a, a very special orbit that we use for communicating with the Earth. Now let's uh, talk about the sun a little bit and talk about some of the things that come out of the sun. The most obvious one is the one you can see right now when you look at the window, and this is uh, sunlight, or more scientifically, solar radiation. And it's made up uh, for the most part of visible light, 40%. Uh, uh, some light we can't see that's called infrared light, and some other light we can't see that's called ultraviolet light. So all that taken together uh, forms sunlight. And sunlight is actually made up of little tiny particles called photons, which move very fast. They move at the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers per second, so extremely fast. Photons have no mass, but they do have what we call momentum, which is uh, particularly uh, interesting when we start looking at solar sails. So in addition to sunlight, there are some things you can't see coming out of the sun, and it's called the solar wind. And the solar wind is a stream of charged particles, so mainly protons and electrons. So these are the, the basic building blocks of atoms. And the sun is constantly sending these out in a stream which moves at a speed of about 900 kilometers per second. 
So still very fast, but uh, some 300 times slower than uh, the sunlight coming from the, the sun. So these charged particles uh, are grouped together and they are extremely hot, uh, basically a million degrees Celsius. And we call this type of soup made up of charged particles that are very hot, we call that a plasma. So in the little picture up here, you can see some plasma emanating from the surface of the sun. And some of that ends up coming straight at the earth in the form of the solar wind. Now here's uh, the thing we mainly want to be concerned with today, and this is called a solar sail. So this is a very special type of spacecraft. It's uh, normally a big square shape, very thin. In fact, the thinness of a solar sail well, is such that the thickness is much less than the thickness of a sheet of paper. So these are very thin and quite often you can see right through them. Although on one side we tend to put a metallic coating so that they're nice and shiny. So they basically act as a, a giant mirror in space. So when the sunlight hits it, it actually helps to propel uh, the solar sail. And for reasons I'll get into in a moment, these sails, uh, we would like them to be very large and not weigh very much so that we can get a, a useful force from sunlight acting on it. So solar sails are, are kind of analogous to a sailboat on the surface of Earth. So here we have sort of a fanciful picture that, that kind of tries to make that point. So depending on how you steer a sailboat, that controls the direction it goes because of the way the wind hits the sails. Well, the solar sail, depending how you steer the sail in space, that controls the direction of the forces that act on it due to the sun, and then that would in turn control its orbit or its, uh, its uh, path in space. So how do solar sails work? Well, first of all, they don't use the solar wind for propulsion. So those electrons and protons coming out of the sun, that's not what causes the force on the sail. Rather, it's just plain sunlight. Uh, sunlight, because of its photons moving very fast, exerts a pressure. So for example, the lights in your classroom right now are exerting a force on you right now and pushing on you. But because the force is so small and you're not very big, you don't notice it. Well, the solar sail, because it's so big and the force of gravity acting on it is so small, we do notice this effect of sunlight pressure. The force produced due to sunlight pressure depends on how big the area of the sail is. And that's why we want to make them as large as we possibly can so that we get a, a greater force. Also, the acceleration, so how fast the sail uh, speed in, ends up increasing depends on keeping the mass of the sail very uh, light. So that's why we try to make the sail so thin, so that the mass of the sail is not large. Just to give you an example, uh, maybe a 40 meter by 40 meter solar sail uh, would have uh, a mass maybe 70 kilograms. So, so it's a very large object and it doesn't weigh very much. So this is a little diagram just to show you how a solar sail works. Coming out of the sun, we have photons that hit the sail and then because the sail is nice and shiny, they bounce off it just like light would bounce off a mirror. So because we've changed the direction of the photon's motion, we have to exert a force on those photons. And Sir Isaac Newton in his third law told us whenever we have an action like that, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we put a force on the photons in this direction and as a result, we get a reaction force on the sail. And that would be the direction of the force acting on the sail. And that force is more or less in the, what we call the normal directions of the sail, so perpendicular to its surface. And because it depends on how you orient the sail, this gives you a way to control the path of the sail by steering it in an appropriate way. So this is why we say they're like sailboats in space, because it's very much analogous to the wind on Earth uh, uh, acting on a sailboat. The very first solar sail was launched about five years ago. It was launched by the Japanese and it was called Icarus. And here's a, an artist's depiction of it. It wasn't very big. It was about four meters by four meters, very thin. It spun so as to uh, keep its shape. So the, the, what we call the centrifugal acceleration produced by the spinning sail uh, caused it to stay nice and flat. Uh, they basically launched this in such a way that the sail would go to Venus. And since uh, it was launched, it has actually gotten, it has arrived at Venus. 
Here's an actual photograph of Icarus. Once they got on orbit and deployed the sail, they jettisoned a camera, which they used to take a picture of Icarus, uh, which was then sent to the Earth. So this gives you an example of what it actually looked like when it was up in space. Here's a, a sail that uh, was never launched. Um, it's, uh, it's called Sunjammer, and this shows you it being tested in a thermal vacuum chamber. And you can get an idea of how big it is by looking at these four people at the bottom of the sail. You can also see it's very shiny, and you can almost see through it. It's, uh, it's very, very thin to keep the, uh, the mass down. This was the second solar sail that was ever launched. It was launched about four years ago, and it's called NanoSail D. Again, it was about four meters by four meters, so very small. But the idea with these small sails was to just prove the concept that sunlight pressure could actually be used to affect the orbit of a, of a solar sail. So what good are solar sails? Why would we want to take all the trouble to make a large shiny object like this and actually put it in space? Well, there's, there's two main applications. One is for forecasting what we call space weather, which I'll talk to you in a moment. The other is for communicating with high latitudes, such as the Canadian Arctic. It's very difficult for us to see the Canadian Arctic from normal spacecraft, but as you'll see in a moment, a solar sail is ideal for communicating with high latitudes, such as the polar regions of the Earth. Okay, so to understand what space weather is about, we need to know a little bit about the Earth's magnetic field. You probably have done some experiments using bar magnets and maybe metal filings to show how the magnet produces uh, what we call the magnetic field. The shape of the magnetic field impacts how charged particles, such as the solar wind, are affected. So here's a, a picture of the Earth, and these lines emanating from it are the shape of the magnetic field. And then right next to it shows you the magnetic field of a giant bar magnet. As you can see, the two fields are very similar. So the magnetic field of the Earth is as if there was a giant bar magnet whose south pole was aligned with the geographic north pole, more or less, and the north pole of the magnet is more or less aligned with the south pole of the Earth. And magnetic fields basically produce a force on charges. So if you have a moving electron or proton, it will basically follow the shape of the field lines. Now the solar wind has a, a huge effect on the Earth's magnetic fields. So here's our sun, and coming out from it, these lines show the direction of the solar wind, so the charged particles, the electrons and protons coming towards the Earth. And when they hit the Earth, there's a, a giant shock wave created because they're moving so fast. And then these, the solar wind tends to affect the shape of the Earth's magnetic field. So it actually takes the field lines and drags them out into a big tail. So it's almost like ripping the layers off an onion and pulling them away from the onion. Well, that's what the solar wind does to the magnetic field of the Earth. And as a result, a lot of these charged particles in the solar wind get trapped by the Earth's magnetic field. And that leads to things such as the Van Allen radiation belts, for example. This is just a close-up so you can see what the solar wind, so the yellowish colored lines here are doing to the Earth's magnetic field lines. And again, you can see them getting dragged out along the, the back. Now probably the, the most wonderful phenomenon produced by the solar wind interacting with the Earth's magnetic field is the northern lights, or scientifically the aurora borealis. In the southern hemisphere, there's also the southern lights. So these beautiful colors are produced when the particles in the solar wind get trapped by the Earth's magnetic field and then they follow the field lines and ultimately hit the atmosphere. Now in the atmosphere we have oxygen and nitrogen molecules. So when the solar wind particles hit the atmospheric particles, uh, these beautiful light shows are produced. So that's one example of uh, what we call space weather. So by space weather we mean uh, interactions of the solar wind with the Earth's magnetic field. So it's different than weather on, on Earth, where we talk about is it rainy, is it sunny? Well, in space, we talk about what's the sun doing in the form of the solar wind, and how is that impacting our magnetic field? So sometimes the solar wind gets energized by lots of very energetic particles. Uh, these are due to what we call a coronal mass ejection. So this is when the sun 
due to its own magnetic field, decides all of a sudden to start sending very large uh, projections from the surface of the sun. So here you have an example of what we call a coronal mass ejection. So when these things happen, the solar wind ends up having many more particles than it normally would, and these uh, ultimately descend on the Earth if the coronal mass ejection is pointing in the right direction. So here it shows you uh, the Earth, and uh, you can see this coronal mass ejection moving towards the Earth. So these CMEs, these coronal mass ejections, can have a very bad effect on the Earth. For example, communication satellites, which we depend on for everything from phone calls to the internet, can be damaged. The power grids on Earth, which we use to send electricity from uh, various locations to, for example, our homes, they can be damaged, which causes power outages. And the global positioning system of satellites may also be damaged, which affects everything like how do you determine when the next bus is coming to pick you up? Well, that would not work when the GPS uh, constellation is not functioning properly. So, what do we use solar sails for? Well, we can use them to detect something like a coronal mass ejection and tell the Earth, hey, something nasty is coming your way. So we can do that by putting the sail at what we call one of the Lagrangian points. So these are labeled here as L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. L1 in particular is the one we want to use because it's located midway between the sun and the earth. So if we could put a solar sail right there, it could tell us whether the solar wind is hyperactive and tell earth that, hey, some bad things are coming your way. So this is the first major application of solar sails that we'll probably see when we launch the next uh, big sail. We want to try and get it to the L1 point. In my research, we study how you steer a sail so that it will actually move to one of these Lagrangian points and stay there. So these L1 through L5 points are very special points. If you can put something there, it'll actually stay there relative to the Earth and the Sun. Okay, now I originally talked about a special orbit called a geostationary orbit. These are the ones we use for communication satellites. They're circular orbits, quite large. They're typically about six Earth radii away, and they are uh, very special because the satellite goes around at the same, way, same rate as which the Earth spins. So, for example, this satellite is parked over Africa and will always remain so. As it goes around in its orbit, it'll always stay over top of Africa. That's what makes these orbits so useful for communications. So here we see many spacecraft, three in particular, in a geostationary orbit communicating with the Earth. Now, the biggest problem with the geostationary orbit is you can't see the North Pole. You can't see the high Arctic. So here's my satellite in a geostationary orbit, and here's the polar region of the Earth. We can't actually see that region, and hence we can't communicate with it in a geostationary orbit. Well, solar sails have a wonderful property in that because they involve radiation pressure as well as gravity, you can create orbits that don't necessarily go around a body. So here's the Earth, here's a solar sail over the North Pole of the Earth, and this sail does not actually go around the Earth. Rather, as the Earth goes around the Sun, the sail remains parked over the North Pole. So this is extremely useful for communications. So we call these special solar sail orbits pole sitters, and this is our second major application for a solar sail. We can use it to communicate with the polar regions of the Earth. And because Canada has so much land up in the high Arctic, this would be extremely useful for our uh, communication systems. So one more slide. This basically shows you how you might get from a geostationary orbit. So if we start out with a solar sail in geostationary orbit, so this circular orbit here, how might we get it up to a pole sitter position? Well, this shows you it's a very complicated process involving many orbits of the Earth. And this, I throw up this slide, slide to just show you some of our, our research uh, topics where we're looking at how do you steer a sail to get it to these places like the Lagrangian point or uh, a place up above the North Pole. So that's great. That's all I have to say. And uh, I'm very uh, happy to answer your questions. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that.
Um, I do have several questions here that have already come in, a few in advance, and a few of our viewers have been busy typing away questions as you've been speaking. Um, so what we can do now is take your slides down if you want to click stop sharing, that way we'll see a bit more of you and we'll get to those questions. So the, um, the first question I have is from Ms. Hatter's grade six class in Uxbridge, Ontario, and they would like to know what solar cells are made of. Oh, that's a really good question. Solar cells are made of um, one of two materials, kapton or mylar. So these are very strong materials and they can be made into very thin sheets and uh, they're not shiny, so normally we have to put a very thin metallic coating on them, uh, typically some kind of uh, silver alloy. Uh, so, so we have the two things, mylar or kapton, which are these strong materials in thin sheets, and then we put a coating of, of silver over top of them to make the uh, sail nice and shiny so that we'll reflect uh, photons. Okay, so a few more questions in a similar um, thought process here. Um, how long does it take to, to make a solar sail or to build a satellite, and how much money does it cost to build a solar sail? That's a really good question. So uh, the actual construction can take uh, a fairly long time, so maybe six months to a year, and the cost of a solar sail, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I'm just guessing right now because I don't really have a good answer to that question. But I would think uh, if you look at just the sail itself, so forgetting about the launch and all the costs associated with getting the solar sail up into orbit, just manufacturing the sail itself might cost between 10 and $20 million. That would be my best uh, estimate. So not really a DIY project for home then? Uh, not really, no. You're not going to be making solar sails uh, at home, that's for sure, yeah. All right. Well, I have a question now from Ms. Rosser's class in Calgary, Alberta, and they would like to know if space has light and is space actually black? Uh, yeah, without the sun. Uh, so if you're in an eclipse position, so let's say you're hiding behind the earth and you can't see the sun, then space looks black. But if you're in such a position where the sun can, can hit you, then space uh, does not look uh, all that, uh, all that uh, black if you're looking at the sun. But in regions uh, away from the sun, it, uh, it, it looks black. Now that's a really interesting question because with a solar sail, if you go into a clip, so for example, if you go behind the earth, then the sail no longer functions the way it was intended. Because there's no sunlight hitting it, you don't get the radiation pressure force. So you would just get the effect of, of gravity acting. And that's one of the reasons why when I showed you that last slide of our research where the solar sail was making many, many revolutions of the Earth, the reason why, one reason it takes so many revolutions to get into its target orbit is because as it goes behind the Earth, we lose the radiation pressure force due to the uh, eclipse. So when there's no radiation pressure force, does it continue to move? Yeah, due to gravity. So we have, the interesting thing with the sail is we have tube forces acting on it, gravity and radiation pressure. And to give you an idea, on a very large sail, the force due to the radiation pressure might be 30% of the force due to gravity. So we always have gravity, but it's really the unique combination of the two things, gravity plus the radiation pressure, that allows you to get these special orbits, like the L1 Lagrangian point and the pole sitter position up above the North Pole. They're the if due to the two effects happening at the same time. Great. So how we've talked about how you position your, your solar sail once it's in space or in orbit or on its way to orbiting. What about how you get it out of the Earth's atmosphere? Um, Ms. Hatter's grade sixes want to know how do you get a solar sail up in space? Okay, so a solar sail is launched the same way as a normal satellite. Um, in the last example I showed you, we wanted to start out in a geostationary orbit. The reason why that's a good orbit is it's very high, it's way above the Earth's atmosphere, and it's also because it's used by communication satellites, there are lots of launch vehicles, lots of rockets going to geostationary orbit. So we would get dumped off there. But because the sail is so huge, 
it doesn't actually go up in its deployed shape. It would go up full, folded up inside a little box. So we have this added problem that once it gets dumped off in, say, a geostationary orbit, then we have to deploy it. And that's a really hard problem. It's kind of like, uh, to give you an example, if you've ever seen like a New Year's uh, party horn that starts out all rolled up and then when you blow it, it, it rolls out. Well, that's kind of how a solar sail is deployed. It, it starts out all rolled up like a, like, a, like a New Year's party horn and then you use little springs and things to have it extend. And as it extends, it drags out the sail. So a normal sail has like two crossed beams that are like these New Year's Eve party horns and then stretched between the beams is the sail. So it's all rolled up, and then as these things unfurl, they take the sail with it. So uh, yeah, so we get to these orbits like GEO using uh, a launch vehicle, a rocket, and then once we get there, we deploy the sail, and then we start trying to uh, uh, steer it in such a way that we can get to its final destination. Do you know of any solar sails that have failed to deploy correctly? maybe gotten stuck halfway or something like that? And then what can you do, if anything? Well, that hasn't happened yet. But what has happened, NanoSail D, uh, when it was launched, they lost communications with it. And uh, they didn't know what it was doing, whether it was actually functioning as intended. There was actually no way of communicating with it and finding out where it actually was. But eventually, after a year or so, it, they were able to uh, resume communications with it and find out that it had, in fact, deployed as intended and was uh, uh, being impacted by radiation pressure as predicted. I can only imagine trying to find something that you've worked so hard on for a year before finally uh, realizing what it's been doing for a whole year. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were, they were pretty happy uh, when they were able to communicate with it. Because as you say, you know, many people spend a good chunk of their, uh, their working life uh, getting these things up there and then if it doesn't go according to plan, it's pretty disappointing. Yeah, great. So now we have a, a student who'd like to know if there are any solar cell patents. Patents, that's a good question. Um, I, I think so. Um, I'm, I, I can't tell you for sure, but I'm willing to believe that if uh, a company comes up with a, you know, a very novel way, for example, of how to deploy a solar cell, then they might put a patent on that process. But uh, a lot of space uh, projects are, are done by national space agencies. So, for example, NASA, for example. And uh, so NASA typically uh, would not, being a government agency, would typically not patent its processes. Uh, they would be what we call in the public domain and other people could use them. Excellent. Well, thank you so much to our student in Ajax for that question. Um, I think maybe one of our last questions here, do you help to build the solar sails at all? We'd like to. Uh, we currently are mainly just looking at the mathematical modeling. So we do simulations. That's how we predict what solar sails are going to do. But in the future, it'd be very nice to be able to get involved. Now, it would be a team of people. It wouldn't just be me and my students. But we uh, are hoping to persuade the Canadian Space Agency that, uh, that Canada should have a solar sail mission. And we would very much like to be involved with that. We'll have to stay tuned to see when that happens. Mm -hmm. um, so before we, we sign off today, one last question for you. If students are interested in pursuing this type of engineering or perhaps um, if you work with a team, someone who's maybe not an engineer on your team, what subjects can they pursue in their studies to set themselves up well for this area okay. of research? Okay, so if you're interested in, in engineering uh, in general, then what you need to do is take lots of science and mathematics in high school. So in grade 12, you would be taking uh, calculus. Uh, and relations and functions, courses like that. And then you would also take sciences. And so probably the most important of those for aerospace engineering would be physics. But uh, you also are required to take chemistry and uh, many people also take biology. So they would take all three of the, the sciences offered in high school. But it's basically, yeah, math and science. And also in, to communicate in engineering, we basically have to be very good at English as well. So you, mm -hmm. you would definitely take English in high school as well. And then uh, if you want to take specifically aerospace engineering, 
there aren't that many schools in Canada that offer it. Really, there are just three. The University of Toronto, Ryerson University here in Toronto, and Carleton University in Ottawa. But I'm biased. Of, of the three, I would, <laughs> I would strongly suggest you come to the University of Toronto and take, in particular, the Engineering Science Program, which is our entry into the aerospace option. Great. And what is your favorite part of what you do? Uh, I guess it's uh, control systems are very satisfying because there's an objective you're trying to accomplish. And when you're able to apply math, like control systems ultimately are a piece of mathematics that runs on a computer. And uh, when you actually try it out for the first time and it actually works and does what you want it to do, that, that I find particularly satisfying. Excellent. Well, we've got thank yous coming in on the chat here from our viewers. Uh, they're thanking you for answering their questions. Um, I'd like to thank you as well for spending time with us today to teach us about solar sails and, uh, and share your expertise. So uh, thank you very much from all of us. No problem. Thank you very much, Stacey. It was a pleasure to, uh, to talk to all of the students out there. Excellent. Well, next week on PIR Live Event, we're talking about aquatic ecosystems. For more information on this and other future PIR Live Event webinars, you can head over to PIRweb.org. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Okay, bye.